and they've tap danced. Sorry, uh, Cassie Webb's going by in her ambulance right now. <laughs> Go get him, Cassie. You're a hero. <laughs> And I'm sorry your mom died in the Amazon while she was researching the uh, spiders. It is no secret that the superhero genre of filmmaking has gotten oversaturated and rather inconsistent. What used to be a surefire bet at the box office now typically ends with a whimper more often than it does with a bang. Marvel, once a front runner with this style of movie, is now going back to the drawing board, scaling down the quantity of these films to focus on quality. DC has just finished squeaking out the last of its Marvel Cinematic Universe equivalent attempt, with films like Aquaman 2, Blue Beetle, and of course the Flash ranging from mediocre to very, very bad. They've also put former Marvel creative James Gunn in charge of retooling the entire DC superhero catalog for a new cinematic universe type of adventure. And then there's Sony, who seemingly has not gotten the message that they need to go back to the drawing board as well. Now this gets a little confusing, but I'll try to reiterate it as best and briefly as I can. Back when Marvel was broke, like pre-Iron Man, they sold off the rights to a lot of their iconic characters to other studios and media media companies. One of those media companies is Sony, and they currently hold the rights to Spider-Man and a lot of other Spider-Man universe-related characters. Things have gotten a little less hostile between Marvel and Sony over the years. That's how the Tom Holland films got made. But in order to keep the rights to the Spider-Man characters, and possibly launch a successful superhero franchise of their own, Sony keeps making their own Spider-Universe type films. And in some ways, this has worked out, like the Spider-Verse films. But when it comes to their live-action movies involved, these spider characters, they haven't had the greatest track record. Sony's latest attempt at a live action superhero film is Madam Web. In the Spider-Man comics, the character first appeared as an elderly paraplegic blind woman who can see the future. However, once the promotional material for this version of Madam Web came out, people soon understood that Sony was not necessarily going in this direction with the character. At least at first. Dakota Johnson was cast as the main character Cassandra Webb, with Sydney Sweeney being cast in a supporting role. And the more that has been revealed about this movie over the last few months, the worse it has looked for the filmmakers and everyone involved. The first sign of trouble came when the trailer for the movie dropped in November of last year, and people really grabbed onto a particularly cringy Dakota Johnson line read, in which she says, quote, he was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. Spoiler alert, that line is not in the movie. Dakota Johnson herself, who has never exactly been known for holding back an interview Interviews, also has been going around in her press tour to promote the movie, but she ends up kind of always saying something about how making superhero movies is a soulless cash grab experience, and she sounds like she knew that the movie was not going to be well received before it even came out. And possibly the funniest piece of information that has surfaced since Madam Web came to light, when Sydney Sweeney and Dakota Johnson were both cast in the film, they tagged Marvel in their Instagram posts about it, meaning that they were likely under the assumption that they were going to be in a traditional traditional MCU film and not a Sony Frankenstein spin-off. These actresses quite literally did not know the shitstorm that they were getting into. With all of this in mind, I knew that I had to go see this train wreck for myself. The film was released to general audiences on Valentine's Day, and so my boyfriend Brian and I got a fancy Italian dinner, and then we sauntered over to our local AMC, not knowing what to expect or the bloodbath that we would soon be in for. Brian is the biggest Spider-Man fan that I know, so this experience was particularly painful for him. It was awful. I'm sorry to barge on your recording, but it was just terrible. So I'm going to briefly explain the plot of this movie before we talk about it in depth. Spoiler warning, three, two, one. The film opens in 1973 in the Peruvian Amazon with Cassandra Webb's mother researching spiders. The spider that she's looking for is apparently very rare, has never been caught on film, and has specific healing properties. Then a guy named Ezekiel Sims, who is also in the rainforest doing this spider project decides to steal the spider for himself, injuring Cassie's mom in the process. Cassie's mom is also pregnant with her at this time, and while she's basically bleeding out, a bunch of Amazonian spider people come to her rescue and deliver the baby. Cassie's mom is also bitten by the spider. Fast forward to 2003, and Cassie is now working as a paramedic in New York City, alongside fellow EMT Ben, played by Adam Scott. After a near-death experience on the job, Cassie begins to have visions of the future. Meanwhile, Ezekiel is apparently haunted with the same dream every night that 
three girls in spider suits are going to show up to his home, take the spider that he stole, and kill him. In order to avoid his fate, Ezekiel then seduces and fucks an NSA agent, killing her after gaining access to this advanced surveillance technology, which he then gives to his assistant, who is then able to track the three girls, Julia, Maddie, and Anya, around New York City, ideally so he can locate them and kill them before they discover their powers. At one point, all of these girls happen to get on the same train, Cassie has a vision of Ezekiel coming to kill them, and she then intervenes, thus preventing that future from happening, but now she essentially has these three teenage girls in her custody, and everyone thinks that she abducted them. Cassie then makes the connection off on her own, that Ezekiel was one of these spider guys that her mom wrote about, and that they may have actually known each other. We get a couple more scenes of Cassie trying to harness her vision powers in order to stop this guy from hunting the girls, and we also get to know a little bit more about the girls and their individual personalities, but not too much, basically that all of their parents kind of collectively abandon them. Cassie then goes off to Peru to meet the spider people who saved her during childbirth, then learns the story of why her mom was actually in the Amazon looking for this particular spider, which I'm gonna just save for a separate rant in a minute. She then forgives her mom for dying, I guess. Then she returns to save the girls and kind of uses her visions to outsmart and outmaneuver Ezekiel. But in this big end battle scene, if you can even call it that, she ends up falling into the ocean and basically having another near-death experience and then the girls bring her back to life. But she is now paralyzed and blind, hmm, and tells the girls about visions that she has of them in the spider suits fighting crime, yada, yada, yada. And that is the only time that we see any of the girls fighting crime in the spider suits. And then that's the end of the movie. It's insane. Okay, so that's a lot to unpack. I guess I'm gonna start with the fact that Cassie as a main character is not very compelling. She's just kind of a vessel for things to happen to and around her. And the only development they really give her is that she kind of hates, spites, and resents her mom for the fact that she died during childbirth. Which brings me to what is in my opinion the craziest thing that happens in this movie that I kind of skimmed over when giving a general plot summary. Basically, once Cassie goes to meet the Peruvian Amazonian spider people and they give her a vision of the past and she learns more about her mom. Cassie sees a flashback of her mom pregnant and talking to a doctor and the doctor tells her mom that Cassie has like a neurogenerative disease and it's implied that she will have a hard life or maybe won't survive when she is no longer, you know, in utero. And then her mom is like, okay, but I've been researching these spiders that have healing properties in the Amazon. I don't want my child to be sick. I don't want her to have this horrible, life as a disabled person so I'm going to go to the Amazon nine months pregnant to try and find this spider so that I can use its healing properties to make sure that my kid is not disabled. And then Cassie goes, wait, I'm not sick, so that means that it worked when the spider bit her. So she's like, oh, my mom did actually love me. She traveled to the Amazon nine months pregnant and put her own life at risk to make sure that I wasn't disabled. Which is such a bonkers plot point for a movie, first of all. And I'm not one to typically point out like, oh, I think this plot point of this, you know, superhero movie is problematic or whatever. But I don't know, when this happened, I turned to Brian, I was like, yo, is Madam Web fucking ableist? And I think the answer might be yes. But that's kind of the only real development that Cassie ever gets. And then from that point on, she kind of knows exactly what to do at every point in the movie and how to outsmart and defeat this guy. But she doesn't actually fight him. She just kind of uses like tactics to like outmaneuver him in a smart way, but it's not in a way that's entertaining. Because if you're coming to see a superhero movie, it's implied that you're going to see superheroes fight a supervillain, and that does not happen at any point in this film. That shot that everyone keeps sharing of Sydney Sweeney in the spider suit, that is literally only in the movie for two seconds, and it's in like an implied vision of the future. And that's another big complaint I have too. The other three girls didn't need to be in this movie. There's no real chemistry or camaraderie between them because they're barely in the movie. It's very unbalanced in terms of Cassie being the main character and these other girls just sort of being there but not for any actual purpose or comedic relief or anything really. Like they did not need to be in the movie. They had no names, they had no spider identities. It was a huge waste of potential. And speaking of a huge waste of potential, I did want to talk about this film's implied place in in the Spider-Man canon, and I'm going to let Brian explain this. They're all at, for some reason, I don't even remember how they got there, they're at Mary and Richard Parker's house, and Mary is pregnant with a baby, and everyone's saying, oh, Ben is so excited to be an uncle, and early in the movie, Ben's like, I met someone, what's her name? Oh, I'm not gonna say, it's serious. So then they all sit around at this baby shower for, for, for the baby, and she asks, 
what do you guys think the name is gonna be? They don't say Peter, and everyone knows it's Peter. It's because, like, we, we don't need movies about Spider-Man that are about Spider-Man but don't have Spider-Man in it. It's so stupid. Why, why do we, why do we, like, why is that so fascinating to people? Oh, people are just gonna love that Peter Parker's referenced for, for a two-hour movie. Like... Also, uh, Peter Parker's mom is played by Emma Roberts, which is hilarious because all I can think about is uh, this new season of American Horror Story where she's like pregnant and having like a, a demon baby pregnancy the whole time. So that was a weird coincidence. And also Spider-Man as, as a fundamental character is about a got dude, dude who gets bitten by a random spider. It could happen to anyone. Anyone can wear the mask. That's the point of the character. I understand a lot of this does come from the comics. It's not like the filmmakers fault they were adapting source material. But that's the worst source material in Spider-Man. Because it makes Spider-Man not it makes Spider-Man not special. It makes him like come from a bloodline like in fucking Star Wars. Like like oh, could only the force could only be used by these people. Peter Parker was destined to be Spider-Man. No, he wasn't. He was just there. The spider could have been anyone. So what you're saying is that you loved it. I'm saying I fucking love Spider-Man. <laughs> And I fucking hate what Sony does sometimes with this goddamn franchise. Make a Spider-Man movie in live action that just has Spider-Man in it. That just has Spider-Man in it. You don't have to be like, Spider-Man's over there in the corner. Or he's about to be born, but he's, he's, he's here, but he's not here. Just give us Spider-Man. Also, this gets even more confusing because the whole time I thought that this was connected to the Andrew Garfield movies in the Sony Spider-Verse. Like, I thought that Emma Roberts was now canonically Peter Parker, Andrew Garfield's mom, and then Brian was like, oh no, this is a separate decanonized Sony universe that has nothing to do with those movies. So they're trying to do like these weird half-ass cheeky nods to Spider-Man like Brian said, but they won't actually put him or any direct references to him in the movies. Did you guys just see Madam Web? Yeah. Did you also think it was really bad? <laughs> I thought it was like so bad it was good. I couldn't <laughs> stop laughing the whole time. Oh my god. I just want to briefly say the funniest moment that we had in the theater was in the beginning where, or it was toward the beginning, where Dakota Johnson is taking a train up to Poughkeepsie, <laughs> and a guy gets on the train, and he goes, is this the train to Mount Vernon? And yeah. we're from this area, yeah. and Brian's family is from that area, and he looks at me and he goes, he's not on the train to Mount Vernon. I knew it. And then the guy gets off the fucking train. He I... a point to show him on the wrong train, then when he gets on the right train, Dakota Johnson gets back on that train, so he goes, am I on the right train? That was the heaviest laugh I had the whole fucking time. Like the attention. It's weird because for a movie, you know, we could play, give credit to it. It's shot on location. Like the New York City scenes, they're all shot here. Yeah. Which you can't say about a lot of Marvel movies. So I, I applaud it. it. They shot somewhere kind of close to where I work. And it was weird to see on film. It was cool to see on film. Yeah. And it, I remember when they were shooting in Grand Central and. It's cool to see that, you know, kind of see that actually happen, but I'm, I'm appraising it for its shooting locations. That's, that tells you the quality of the that's, movie. That's about it. They, they, had, a, they had a Beyonce uh, album cover from 2003 on the, like, it was like a poster. Some, some pretty funny, they, some pretty kind of funny, made me chuckle actually, 2003 references. Yeah, yeah. You know? Toxic by Britney Spears. Um, Love that song. Aesthetically, a lot of things were like kind of accurate to the time. Yeah, I mean, it was it was shot in a place. It was shot in a place. It was shot in a place where we live. We live in the place it was shot. Yeah. So, we were literally just like that soy meme that's like. Oh. It's also worth mentioning that aside from, you know, filming on location, which we will give them props for, this movie has no individual style. It's all kind of coded in that classic Sony superhero sludge. Everything is like green, black, and red, but in like the most unflattering combination and shade possible. It seemed like they kind of used all of the wrong takes for all of the actors. Like you could tell that they were almost marking it and not doing it full out. Cause at least with Dakota Johnson, she's kind of like that normally. Right. You know what I mean? But yeah. like. With Sydney Sweeney, we've at least seen her give layered performances. Like, she has somewhat of a decent acting capability, but in this, she was just so half-assed, it was kind of crazy. Her and, and Dakota Johnson, for the most part. Like, I... 
they just didn't want to be there. You can you can see them lose interest like actively as the movie goes on. I know they don't shoot it chronologically necessarily, but that's how it felt at least. Adam Scott was the only person giving any kind of performance, and I just want to say, guys, he's good in Parks and Rec. He's good in Severance. Go watch him in either one of those shows, please. The ADR was terrible. At some points, there are just like moments where the villain is not talking. Like he is not moving his mouth, and when he is, it is not in sync with what he's saying at all. This was a bad film. I do not recommend going to see it. However, if you were under the influence of substances and you were with a group of friends, it might be a pretty good time. It's worse than The Flash and that was already a really low bar. I'm disappointed. You should be disappointed. Demand better from your movies. What's the worst superhero movie you've ever seen? Because for me, this is it. Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks so much, you guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye.